This episode of Ragcast Outdoors is brought to you by PK Lures, Bow Spider, and High Mountain Seasonings. Fish on! Hey, Radcast is on! Hunting, fishing, and everything in between. This is Radcast Outdoors. Here are David Merrill and Patrick Edwards. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Radcast Outdoors. I'm your host today, Patrick Edwards, and David Merrill is not with us today because he's on his way to Kodiak and he's going to go after a mountain goat up in the Kodiak Island. And so we just had a great trip going to Alaska and catching sockeye and doing lots of other fishing. And apparently David didn't get enough from that. So he's going to go up and do some hunting. And I'm a little bit jealous because he's going to see some amazing country and we're all saying prayers for him that he doesn't get eaten by a bear either. But anyway, today I'm really excited because I have a couple of special guests with me. I'm actually on location at the Wind River Indian Reservation, and we're going to talk about indie flies. So I want to welcome Art and Matt to the show. So welcome, guys. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's good to have you on the show. So mm-hmm. we're going to talk about indie fly and just kind of do some introductions here. So uh, I'm going to start with you, Matt. You're executive director running things at Indie Fly. So tell us a little bit about yourself and about Indie. Yeah, sure. So um, Indie Fly is a nonprofit. We help indigenous communities around the world protect the resources. But we take a little bit different approach. So we give them an enterprise-based system to do it. So we help them own and operate eco lodges, right? So often, most often, all the time, fly fishing. And the reason why we focus on fly fishing, we always get this question. So I'll answer it now, which (laughs) is, you know, why out of all the things do you guys pick fly fishing? And there's a few reasons. One, it's familiar to communities that we work with, right? Oftentimes people fish to feed their families or um, fish for sport. And we just teach them a little bit different way to do it and and how to host people doing it and the business side of an eco lodge and all that. Um, And then, uh, you know, it can be lucrative. Uh, Fly English tend to spend a lot more money than anyone else. And they're willing to travel. They're willing to go places that nobody else has gone to fish. And uh, it's also sustainable. Every project we have is catch and release. We really focus on science in the beginning. That way we can understand what a fishery can take in terms of pressure. And then we also focus on these three pillars that we'll talk about, I'm sure, as we go. But um, one of them is cultural, right? We think cultural sustainability is really important in every project. And not only um, do we want to improve the culture locally, oftentimes, like if you talk about uh, a case like Wind River, where we are, unfortunately, years have been spent trying to destroy that culture. And some of it's been lost. So creating systems to bring it back um, and then make it better. And look, that's not our charge to lead. That needs to be led by, you know, people of the reservation. But if we can provide some help in doing so, that's what we do. And look, at the end of the day, too, it's a great business practice. You're here in the Wind River Reservation and all around you is amazing trout fishing, right? So how do you pull people from say Jackson or other places around here and bring them to the reservation? Well, one of the things that we've identified in other projects around the world is that people want that cultural immersive, you know, experience. And, uh, you know, I always tell the story of it tends to be the anglers that go, they typically fish all around the world and the stories that they go back and tell their buddies at the bar or their family at dinner doesn't revolve around, I caught this many fish and they were this big. It's, I met these amazing people and had this immersive experience. And so that can go a long way from the business side too, right? Um, the economic side, you know, we're a job creating organization. Here you have 80% unemployment and amazing resources. So how do we sustainably use those resources to create jobs? And then um, that third pillar is the um, science pillar, the environmental pillar. And again, you know, everything that we do, we want to improve the resource. Here, it's a little bit different because this is a pristine place and we want to keep it that way. So what's the balance of bringing people in and helping with the 80% unemployment rate? Um, but also, you know, making sure that it doesn't turn into an operation like you can find down the river of you run a day boats a day or you're casting shoulder to shoulder with someone. So um, those are kind of the three pillars. At the end of the day, if we do all these things right, then we can get into a little bit more of the specifics of how we do it. Um, You know, it creates those sustainable livelihoods. It um, creates some economic incentives for for, um, the local community to protect those resources, right? Better resource, better business. And, uh, you know, so that's why we do what we do. And Art, I want you to talk a little bit about yourself just to give some background. I was just fortunate enough to meet you 
um, this year with Leadership Wyoming. We came in, in April and got to sit down with you, and I was just really intrigued hearing you kind of tell the story, obviously, about your partnership and working with IndyFly, but also talking about unique challenges of the Wind River Indian Reservation, how the game and fish here is different, right? And some of the challenges that you have. And I was just really inspired by that meeting. And so I'm really glad that we actually get to sit down and record and talk about some of this stuff. But I was wondering if you could also just introduce yourself, talk a little bit about tribal game and fish and uh, just tell us a little bit more. Yeah. So I'm, I'm Arthur Lawson. I'm an enrolled Northern Arapaho tribal member. I'm the director of tribal fishing game here on the Wind River Indian Reservation. This is my sixth year being as a director and, you know, what we provide is totally different from the state. We're different in everything. I mean, it's over like a whole different world over here. And so what we, we allow is uh, just fishing permits on the reservation, and that leads to any roads or trailheads to any open waters. And uh, hunting only for tribal members. And so what we're trying to do in our partnership with IndyFly is create more opportunities and business in the outdoors and get people jobs in the outdoors and get the tribal youth involved and spark some passion into them to get them well, all youth into the outdoors. Yeah, and that's been one of the things that David and I started this podcast was to really get kids involved in the outdoors and also get non-traditional anglers, hunters, people out in the field, right? Because David and I, that's what we do. We love to hunt and fish, and there's a reason for that. Like, we feel like we're more connected, you know, with the wildlife, with conservation, through our efforts doing that. And so I see this as kind of a, win-win here, you know, talking about indie fly and talking about some of the benefits to the youth, you know, getting them off of a tablet. We talk about this a lot, getting them off a tablet, getting them off of YouTube, getting them into the mountains, getting them onto a body of water and trying to catch a fish, which I think is one of the most fun things in the whole world. I'm a little biased because fishing is my thing, but there is something about that chasing a fish, trying to get it to hit a lure, to hit a fly, whatever it is that just it speaks to everybody's soul. Like you see it when you take someone for the first time and they catch, you know, a little brook trout out of a stream or a bluegill out of a lake. Like you see them light up with that. Wow. I can't believe I just caught that. That was really cool. I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about that. Like, you know, maybe Matt, you could talk about like how indie fly really is aimed at that like youth aspect too, of helping the youth out here on the reservation? Yeah, so we really started as an international organization, and we always wanted to do a domestic project. And, you know, we did our due diligence on quite a few of them, and then we started spending time here and, uh, you know, obviously fell in love with the resources, 2.2 million acres, pristine place, amazing fishing opportunities. Um, But also we fell in love with the people. And one of the first things that we did here on the reservation is we took a bunch of kids camping. And, um, you know, we weren't that far off the highway system here. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it was a pretty fairly easy trip. And uh, we took eight or 10 kids. And I just had this vivid memory of like, you know, I naively went into it expecting to learn something about the reservation or about, you know, where we were specifically. And what I found was that, you know, with the exception of one of those kids, they'd never been to where we were. And it just kind of blew my mind. And so we kind of took a refocus of, all right, let's really take our time to make sure that kids here have healthy opportunities to get in the outdoors. And, um, you know, there's, there's many challenges to that, right? But, you know, these are the future stewards. And if we're trying to create generational change in projects, which we do, you know, it's going to take their generation to move it forward. And so we really refocused on how we engage youth on the reservation. And, uh, you know, so we've created a few programs. Some have been successful. Some, um, you know, need some reworking, honestly. But, uh, you know, one of, one of the things that Art and I did kind of in the beginning was we met with every school administrator and the recurring theme was, look, if you don't play basketball, there isn't really a good opportunity on the reservation to not get in trouble after school. Right. And so um, one of the things that we focused on pretty early was creating uh, outdoor programs in schools. Um, and one of them has been pretty successful, like at, at the high school. And, uh, you know, those kids go and they learn about bugs and they learn about water and they learn you know how to tie flies and all those things. And then eventually they get on the water and they get that passion. Right. Um, and so one of the reasons that we, I think, focus on that is one, because there are lots of opportunities, unhealthy opportunities to engage here. Right. Um, 
you know, a lot of the kids here in art, you can speak to this better than I can, tend to be raised by an older generation, right? Their grandparents in a lot of cases. And so that creates a lot of challenges. Yes, you have the dependency on screens, just like every other kid in America. And, um, you know, but you also have access issues. And so how do we create programs to make that access easier, right? Um, Here, you know, you can drive down the road and get on a body of water, but you can also hike, you know, nine hours, or you can get on a horse for a very long time, art and have good horse stories. Um, and you know, there's just such a diverse amount of water here. And so, um, you can appeal to a lot of people and, you know, um, I think part of what we really try to do is again, create those healthy opportunities. Um, you know, you have addiction here, right? But as art always says, you can be addicted to the outdoors as well. So how do we create that opportunity and create this spark and this passion for conservation? And, um, you know, that tends to be a long road, but we're in it for the long haul. This portion of the podcast is brought to you by PK Lures. If you're like me, you're probably out on the water pursuing your favorite fish this time of year. Open water season is the most fun for me, and I always have PK lures in my tackle box ready to go for my fishing trips. Some of the ones that I would recommend for this time of year are the PK spin jig If you're a jig fisherman, it's a must-have. It adds extra flash to your jig. You can tip it with anything you want, and it is downright effective for trout, walleye, panfish, and bass. The other thing I'd recommend is if you like to troll, there's a lot of options for that as well. My kids and I have done really well on the Ridgeline crankbait this season. We've caught a ton of different trout and also a lot of walleye. So that's a great option as well. If you like to troll crawler harness type options, the PK Wobbler and PK Dakota Disc have always been a go-to bait for me. So you can check all these out and much more at pklure.com. Again, pklure.com. Back to the show. And I think the three of us share that addiction for the outdoors, which is a good thing, right? A good, healthy thing. But yeah, Art, why don't you talk about that? Just like some of the unique challenges here, you know, for the community and the kids that maybe they're facing and where, you know, taking them fishing really does help them. Well, like Matt was saying, you know, getting the opportunity to get them up to the mountain or a body of water, capability of getting in a vehicle and going somewhere. A lot of these kids don't have that ability to, um, to get to these places. And so what we want to do is, create like a outdoor recreational school or a natural resource higher education where we can go and pick up these kids and take them out and we can go create like an opportunity like Knowles natural outdoor leadership school is pick up these kids and do a week long of just hiking you know a week long to go fishing or horseback riding in the mountains because what you see up there is 10 times better than what you see down here below the mountains and so what we're trying to do is create that opportunity and get the kids interest and see how many kids keep coming back and get involved. And then so after that, we want to start a guide school and get more outfitters in the backcountry and more people on horse and horseback and stuff. So not only are we patrolling or taking clients up, but we can also pick up trash and keep it clean up there. I wanted you to talk a little bit about, you know, you talked about being a youth to our leadership Wyoming group and, you know, how you got involved in the outdoors. And I think that would be kind of cool to share. So can you talk about how you started as a youth getting into the outdoors? You know, I was born and raised in the outdoors. My whole family hunting, fishing, horn hunting, trapping, you name it. That's all we ever did. So that's, I take my grandson, my kid, my daughters. We're all hunter, fishermen, and we always go. And even on my days off, I'm still up there doing it. And so, you know, I, I just was raised that way. And, you know, to have somebody to take uh, tribal youth up there to give them the opportunity to see it. And I think putting a fish on a line for a youth will, will get them addicted uh, being up there all the time will be addicted. You know, like Matt says, it, it's you know relaxing when you're up there and just taking in the air and the scenery and everything else. Well, yeah, and I think, you know, Matt, you can talk about this, you know, coming from somewhere else and coming here and getting out and being in those wide open places. Just kind of talk about what that's been like for you. Yeah, I mean, this is, people think I overstate it all the time, but they clearly haven't been here. You know, it, it's, um, I've been coming here for, I don't know, six, seven, eight years or something like that. And I still haven't seen half the reservation, I feel like. Um, and it's just, it's, it's so vast and there's so many unique opportunities here. And oftentimes, um, you know, people don't understand whether they're from here or not, what, what's really here. I mean, you're within the Yellowstone ecosystem, right? You have 
all the same resources. You have um, geographically, the footprint is almost the, the same um, in terms of size. And, but you just have so f- much fewer resources for protection and conservation programs and all of that. And so, you know, how do we, again, um, make sure that Art and his peers have the tools to protect it, um, you know, long term as we invite more people in is something we, we really focus on. Um, you know, that's, I would say, our number one goal is to make sure that this place remains pristine in every way, but also, again, solve some of the challenges economically. Yeah, I guess that would be something to kind of talk about art is, you know, you're talking millions of acres and just a handful of people to ensure that people are abiding by the rules that things aren't getting, you know, destroyed and messed up. And so can you talk a little bit about the challenges that you guys have covering all of that ground? Well, you know, the number one challenge for everything is funding. That's the biggest challenge um, for everything out here on the reservation, job creation, uh, building, making a better program and everything else. Then that's kind of like Matt was saying, to get the youth involved, to get them like me. I, I do. I became a game warden because, of, you know, that's the only p- job in the mountains or in the outdoors on the reservation. So when I grew up, that's the only way I could get paid to be on the mountains, become a game warden. And that's what I did. So if we can get youth involved to become outfitters or biologists, wardens, everything else, I, I think that um, if we get more tribal members involved and wanting to create these opportunities, I think that'll bring in a lot more funding for the program. And what is your current funding source, like primary source? So our primary primary source is the sale of uh, fishing permits. And then other than that, we, we go out and receive grants from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So I'll jump in here. Um, Art's extremely humble. Um you know, you have 2.2 million acres in an office of, you know, um, five people basically, right? Uh, so you have Art and uh, three other wardens. You take that uh, on shifts. Each warden's responsible for covering a million acres on average. It's an impossible job. Impossible. Unfortunately, people know that, right? And, and there's some people who want to take advantage of that. But, um, you know, back to the fishing license sales, it's, it's, uh, it's a really unique thing that is growing, which I think is great because like everywhere else, you know, in, in the North American model, right? Fishing license, hunting license, they, they fund conservation, right? It's not different here. And so, um, you know, as you've seen the uptick in, in interest, right? You, you get a little bit more funding from that, but the, it, it far uh, undermines the need or, or, you know, it's far less than the need. And so, you know, one of the things that we try to focus on together is how can we create different revenue streams to ensure that art has the tools? And a lot of times that's people, a presence um, to make sure that, um, you know, it, the, the enforcement side is there, you know, and, and let me just jump back to kind of the indie fly model and to parlay on something that art mentioned, you know, so if you look at the model, it's really revolves around an eco lodge and eventually we'll build an eco lodge here and it'll be a fly fishing lodge. Right. And so here you have an outfitting structure. You know, we're very clear that this isn't in competition to that outfitting structure. It's a tool for the outfitters to use a supplement, if you will. And, um, you know, that let's call that the hub and we'll call it a hub and spoke model. So if the lodge is the hub, the cool thing about the model is all the smaller scale entrepreneurial activities that revolve around that lodge, right? A shuttle company that somebody can stand up to bring people, you know, to a body of water from the airport or whatever, um, groundskeeping, hospitality, cooks, all those things, you know, like it's a little bit different here in America, but in other projects, you know, somebody has started raising chickens. So there's eggs for, you know, the Western diet in the morning and you can create all those opportunities and it just scales up pretty quickly. Um, but the difference is, is that these are a hundred percent community owned and operated. The ownership part is relatively easy. That's legal paperwork, right? Um, IndieFly doesn't take a cut. 100% of the dollars stay local. Um, and then the operated part gets a little bit more challenging. And, you know, one could stand up a lodge here and you could go fish at, with a bunch of non-enrolled people. And that's not really the model. The model is how can we create jobs locally to, you know, create that sustainable livelihood but those people have to have skill sets, right? And so things like a Native Guide Academy and all those things are super important. Um, at the same time, not everybody can be a guide or wants to be a guide. So, um, you know, 
it can evolve into things like arts and crafts. You know, people can bead and sell stuff to people coming to the, to the lodge and, you know, it just, it, it expands and expands. But I think that ownership part is something that is really important to touch on is that, you know, this is all about creating opportunities locally. So the guide school and things like that are really important. This portion of the podcast is brought to you by high mountain seasonings. It's that time of year. If you're fishing, you're out in the field, you're catching a lot of fish, and you need some good fish brine to smoke up those trout fillets, you can go to highmountainjerky.com or himtnjerky.com. And it's also that time of year to stock up before hunting season. So if you need the absolute best jerky seasoning on the market, you can check out their jerky seasoning kits. They're very easy to do, no matter whether you're doing whole muscle meat or ground jerky. They've got everything that you need. If you want to cook fish, like on a pan sear fish or cook duck or pheasant or whatever you're cooking, they have the seasoning for you. So again, go check out our friends at High Mountain Jerky. You can go to himtnjerky.com and check out all their different options. Now back to the show. Yeah, I think that is important because I mean, when, I mean, I work in economic development. One of the things that you need is you need a good foundation, which you guys have here. I mean, you have some of the best fishing anywhere in the world easily. Like it's not even a question. I <laughs> I love to fish around here. There's a reason I live here, right? So you have that as a foundation. And now with the partnership with Indie Fly, there's some things moving and shaking. And one of the we always talk about the chicken and the egg in economic development, right? Like what come what do you need first or the other? You know, and it's always going back and forth. I think that it's going to be a unique opportunity with the partnership to get something started. And you're right, as that gets going and as people come in, that's going to generate business. And then small businesses are going to pop up and want to be a part of that. And they're going to be able to sell their goods. I mean, there's incredible bead workers here on this reservation. I have a one of the coolest keychains ever at the house. It's just incredible work, but there is a real market for a lot of the things that you guys have here and can sell here. So Art, I don't know if you could talk about that a little bit and kind of your vision for that too, of the different things that could happen after getting, you know, a lodge set up and some of those things. Well, yeah, I think you talking about the bead work and everything else. And then the collection of antlers, you know, you can make chandeliers or, you know, show them, show them off on the wall and everything else like that. And what I do for uh, some of our partners, like deadheads and stuff that we pick up shed hunting mm-hmm. and stuff, I, you know, paint like the, the lodge logo and stuff on them and, and give them out to, you know, that's another opportunity somebody can make money at uh, selling something like that. But, you know, the arts and crafts, that's unstoppable. I mean, that, that can go a long, long way <laughs> from artists and everything else. And then, you know, that working relationship with um, IndieFly uh, brought in a lot of, a lot more partners that we work with, too. So we, we do a lot of work with Patagonia, Yeti, and Costa Sunglasses and stuff. So working with them has helped out quite a bit, too, and, and getting the project up and going. Yeah, one of the other things I want to talk about, because when I say the fishing here is incredible, what types of fish could people come here and pursue? Just as an example, just to give people an idea of like, okay, if I were to come there and I was going to pay for a guide and go fishing, what would I catch? Give give some examples of what people can catch here. Well, you, you know, your snake river, cutthroat, your lake trout, um, your brook trout. Uh, we have tiger trout up on, on, the, on the high alpine lakes and stuff like that. But I like most of the fly fishermen on their bucket list is the golden trout, and we do have like 260 lakes up on the Wind River Mountain Range on the reservation. And so, you know, there's ling, there's walleye. We have a little bit of everything over here. And sauger, which is one of my favorites that a lot of people forget about. It's like the small cousin of the walleye, but it's got a lot more attitude. And I really like the sauger. So there's some really unique things. You've got whitefish as well. There's grayling. There's all kinds of things. If you're a fly fisherman, this is a dream come true. You've got browns. You've got all kinds of different fish here. So when I say the fishing is incredible, if you're one of those guys that's, or gals that's out there chasing species, you can get a whole lot of them knocked off your list by coming to the Wind River Indian Reservation, right? Yeah, and we have, you know, like I said, we have 260 lakes up on the mountain and, you know, down below Bull Lake, Dinwiddie, and everything else. And we do work in partnership with the state of Wyoming on stocking these lakes every year. So the amount of fish is in there. Like just the other day, we stocked about 10,000 cutthroat and moccasin lake. So yeah, we keep them stocked and we did uh, us fish and wildlife does a really good job in the state helping us uh, keep it that way. I have to get laughed out of the room when I tell people this is the best place to fish in the United States. Um, you know, and 
it's that balance again, right? There's get people out there who will say, look, you know, I, I don't want you to tell people about the reservation because that's my honey hole. Mm-hmm. And I always, I'm like, sometimes when my face gets red, I'm sure I'm like, look, <laughs> one, it's not your honey hole. Um, mm-hmm. And two, like the, the opportunity to make an impact here is much greater than, you know, people knowing about your, your, your honey hole. Um, and, you know, I think it's one of those things that we just have to create balance with, right? You know, I, again, we are in the business of making this place, uh, you know, another venue where you have to wait for a boat or you have to, you know, see 13 boats in a day or, you know, you're, you're having trouble finding a spot to fish because there's so many people walking in. Um, you know, luckily you have 2.2 million acres and a bunch of lakes, but you know, back to your, to your species thing, um, you know, like the wind river Canyon, 20 inch brown trout all day. I I mean, it's, it's truly amazing. And, you know, I'll shout out the outfitter there. His name's Darren Calhoun. You know, he has been operating there for 30 years and could easily put 10 boats a day on that stretch of water. And he limits it to two. And the reason why he does is because he wants to ensure that that fishery remains good. Right. Um, you know, so he makes the hard business decision of not driving revenue, but keeping the fishery intact. And I think that's really important. And we're, we're we definitely want to keep that ethic here. And one thing I do want to say, cause I always ask the anglers when I run into them down there in the Canyon is like, have you bought your permit? Because unfortunately there are some guys that will wander down there and they'll take advantage of it and they don't pay their permit. And it's like, this is what's funding to make this such a great fishery for you. So you might want to pay your 115 or 120 bucks, whatever it is, right. To, to fish this for the season. But I mean, it's to me, like people are like, man, I can't believe you pay that much. I'm like, dude, I'm happy to pay this because when I go there and fish, I get blue ribbon quality every time. Like you talked about 20 inch trout all day long. There's a, Tell them they're a lot bigger than 20 inches too. Yeah. So, I mean, you have an opportunity in that canyon for brown trout, rainbow trout, cutthroat trout. There's even walleye and sauger in different parts of it. There's white fish in certain parts of it. I mean, it's it's an incredible fishery. And again, like you said, there's like five people helping, you know, from the tribal side to make that happen. And of course, you've got game and fish and fish and wildlife also helping, but it's it's a lot, but it is an incredible place and I'm really excited because I think, you know, you were talking about getting the youth kind of into this mode of switching off the screens, grabbing a fly rod or a spinning rod, going up, catching fish, spending time in the outdoors. And then hopefully someday, maybe some of them want to be a guide. Maybe some of them want to get into the tourism side and they want to start a business surrounding that. I think the vision for this is really something that's special and I'm hopeful that other people can get involved. So is there a way for folks to get involved in a project like this to help out? Yeah, absolutely. Look, um, I want to tell the Tanner story too, but you know, one of the e- easiest ways is to come here and make an impact by your fishing permit and, and fish, right? Experience it for yourself and then tell everybody else about it or, you know, how they can get involved. The other way is to make sure that you hire an outfitter. This is a big, vast place. If you come here and try to do it on your own, you're missing out on really good opportunities. So, um, you know, pay the extra dollar to hire an outfitter who knows what they're doing and taking you to the right spots. Um, I'll tell the Tanner story just as, you know, kind of a segue. Last year we did a backcountry trip um, and it turned into a little bit more adventure than I think we were all anticipating. <laughs> but, um, you know, we had two young kids with us. We had a family with us and then uh, and a couple of them were pretty young, eight and nine. And um, one, I was just fascinated. We took this 13 hour horseback ride in. It wasn't supposed to be 13 hours to be fair. Um, but uh, that's how you make it an adventure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we get up there and it was one of those things, you know, this kid has fished before and you, you explain to him, you know, fly fishing. And we run across this very funny issue all around the world, which is, when we tell people we're going to teach you how to fish in the most inefficient way possible and people are going to come here and do the same thing and take a picture with the fish and let it go so somebody else can catch it, they just can't comprehend it. Like, why would anyone in the world do that? And uh, eventually, you know, they, they get it. But um, I feel like uh, we're a little bit at fault here for ruining Tanner because we get to this place and we're camping on this stream that just is chocked full of brook trout. And, you know, his first day of fly fishing, he catches like 34 brook trout. And 
I felt a little guilty. I'm like, did we just ruin this kid? Because this is not normal. And, you know, he is totally on board and he loves it. Um, and, you know, what I was so impressed with is the entire 13 hour ride in or whatever it ended up being, um, you know, those kids didn't complain once. And that's where you get the hope, right? Of like, okay. I mean, I have kids that age an hour in, they would have complained. I love them to death, but, um, you know, it's just seeing that and you're like, okay, maybe this can work here. And, uh, it, it's just really inspiring. Yeah. And going back into the, you know, the Canyon and stuff, we, we do know people fish without their permits and everything else and travel game wars. We don't want to be in there harassing people, checking for their permits all day long, every day and stuff. But we are in the canyons. We are, we are going down the, uh, the boats with the outfitter and we're in unmarked vehicles. So we're eventually going to catch you, you know, and it does happen. And like Matt was saying, taking Tanner, there's a future game warden or director right there. I mean, he was just like me when I was that age. I horseback all day, all night, and then fish all day and all night. You know, and then that lead into hunting and everything else. So that that Tanner story is perfect for our, our project. This portion of the podcast is brought to you by The Bow Spider. If you haven't heard of the bow spider yet, you'll have to go to bowspider.com and see what it's all about. If you're a bow hunter and you want to go hands-free in the field, you really need a bow spider packing system. Out here in the West, we cover a lot of miles, and it's good to be able to put your bow on your back or on your side and get a little break from toting it around the field. The bow spider packing system has a lot of different options. You can use it in tree stands. You can use it on the headrest of your truck to transport your bow. You can put it on your pack and carry it around on your back. You can also put it on your side. So if you haven't checked it out, go to bowspider.com and check out the bow spider. You can also go to YouTube and type in bow spider and go to their channel. They have how to videos to show you exactly how to use their products. Again, you can check out the bow spider by going to bowspider.com. Again, that's bowspider.com. Now back to the show. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, the future is bright. I've got four kids and I take them fishing regularly because it's like, hey, you're getting out, you're getting to experience something different. You get to do that fair chase pursuit of whatever species. And my youngest daughter, she's doing the Wyoming Game and Fishes um, Master Angler program. And she's like 11 years old and she's already got five Master Anglers under her belt. She's got the trophy angler status she's halfway to an ultimate angler like she's working on it really hard and i mean that kid she's she's one of those that's going to fish the rest of her life i have no doubt like i'm sure the other ones that may come and go but she's going to make a point of taking trips and doing that but it's because you know i take her fishing often and she's one of those like you know you and i talked about before our is like the weather could be terrible and she's still gonna sit there and fish because she's loves it and just some people just have it inside them i'm one of those people and i think all of us are that's amazing about your daughter good good for her and most importantly good for you i mean you um have served as a great example right and that's something that we want to try to do here is just to be a good mentor for these kids to say hey you know there's another path here there's there's a healthy path to go spend time in the outdoors and look you know i think we all probably all feel that the river or lake or whatever when you have a rod in your hand it can be a healing experience um and so just that introduction is oftentimes the hardest part. Right. And so good for you for doing that for your kids. Um, and we'd like to do a lot more of that here. You ask, you know, how, um, people can get involved. You know, we do these things where we'll do a big group setting and then we'll do an outing. Right. Um, and you know, that outing is a little bit harder cause you need more people. So if people are interested, you know, reach out and volunteer. And the next time we do one, you know, or the next time they come fishing here, call art and say, Hey, do you have any kids I can take, you know, and just take a kid and take them with you and they'll walk beside you and learn. And that goes a long, long way. Yeah. And I'd be happy to do that by the way. Like if you, if you have some people that want to go fishing in the area, I'd be happy to take them along or go along with you guys and support from that end of tying a line or, you know, just kind of saying, here's how you do this or that. That's what it's all about. Like it, it's on us to do it. A lot of people, they like to complain and say, well, our kids are just on their phones all the time or they're on their tablets all the time. It's like, what are you doing about it? Like, have you given them an alternative? Have you taken them and shown them something else? And really it is on us. Like I have another daughter, she's kind of into the fishing, but what she likes to do is take pictures and videos and she likes to 
paint and do art. I'm like, I'm going to support you in that because I mean, that's her thing. And she loves to go outside and do that. And it's like, great. Yeah. My oldest daughter, she's into hunting and horn hunting and everything else, mostly hiking and working out in the outdoors. But my middle daughter's do it. As soon as Indy Fly showed up and we started doing all this fly fishing, that's her number one goal is to become a fly fishing guide. And so she went to work for Darren in the canyon and been there all summer and loves it and then plans on staying there for a long time. Oh, that's awesome. And clients who float that canyon, I mean, they always come back saying, wow. I mean, it is a wow experience. And it's cool that your daughter gets to be a part of that because they're going to remember you know, having her as a guide and having that experience. And I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, again, it, it's this creating this spark, you know, and that's the introduction. And then, you know, some kids will get it and some kids won't, but back to your, your other daughter who likes photography and things, that's a whole nother business, right? I mean, yeah. um, walking along with an angler and taking their photo, those anglers will buy those photos, right? Um, <laughs> you know, I can't draw a stick figure, so I appreciate the art <laughs> side even more, but, um, you know, the whole fish art thing is a whole a world of its own. And, you know, um, people want to support that. And so that's, a, you know, you can get creative with, with, with these opportunities. You know, it doesn't have to be guiding someone. It doesn't have to be sitting in a boat and shoveling water all day. It can be a, a, a vast uh, opportunities in a different way. Right. So, right. So tell me a little bit, just, just so that the audience knows when you talk about, you take kids out and you teach them how to fly fish. What is that? What does that day look like? Or what does that trip look like for a kid? Yeah. So we're doing one on Monday actually. So typically what it starts out with is, um, you know, you try to find a big field and you put a rod in their hand and you teach them how to cast. Right. Um, and then you flip over some rocks and you know, they find bugs and they're like, all right, you know, this is a little bit of entomology. This is what we're trying to do is mimic these bugs in the water and how they float. Um, and then, you know, pretty quickly you have to put them in the water. Typically it's an attention span thing. And then they get in the water and they do a couple casts and you know, it's, it's harder in other places, but here, um, because there's not a lot of pressure, uh, at the right time of day and the right time of year, the fish will eat almost anything. And so you don't have to be an expert angler to land a fish here. And that helps a lot. You know, um, it's one thing to cast a rod in the field all the day. It's another thing to feel the tug on the end of the line. And so, um, you know, once you can get that, and, and a kid is, you know, you see it in their eyes is pretty amazing. Then you have the challenge of creating additional opportunities. So they have, you know, they don't lose the bug, so to speak. Yeah. It was so talking about my daughter who loves to fish. She was fishing for brown trout and she was trying to get a master angler brown. And I had hand tied some jigs and she had helped me with them. So she wanted to use that jig, right? Like that was her thing. She's like, I'm going to use it. It was more of like a tungsten fly, but heavy. So it could get down in the current. And she's fishing this thing and she tells me, she's like, dad, I've got one on. And I'm like, okay, cool. Well, I walk over there and I see that it's like a big brown. It's not a little brown. It's a big brown. And she was so excited. And that was one of the coolest things. But there, there is something about that when that kid actually is out there casting for themselves, feels empowered to do that, feels comfortable because they've got the knowledge. You know, I'd left her alone, like 40 yards down the bank, just letting her do her thing she lands this 24 inch Brown, you know, big old male with a kipe, you know, it was just such a cool fish. And it was like, man, this is awesome. This is what it's about. And just seeing her smile, you know, I mean that I'm sure for you guys, when you take those kids and they hold up that brook trout or grayling or whatever they've caught out of that stream or wherever you're at, I'm sure that is so rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you had a proud dad moment there, I'm sure. And really at the end of the day, that's what makes it all worth it. Right. You know, is to see the, the spark come become a fire in these kids eyes and again you know we do this for uh protection and conservation right um and so if you can get a kid young and help them understand hey you gotta let this thing go so it can get bigger and then you can catch it again um you know that that is something once you get to that mindset it's a totally different ball game and here you know not a lot of people know this but you know, 30 years before the Wilderness Act, they designated a roadless area. Um, the conservation ethic is here already. Um, you know, kids may not understand that and know it, but eventually they will. They understand it's part of their history. So, um, you know, it, it's, I think, easier here to get people to understand that this is what conservation is. And I think it's good to talk about selective harvest too, because there are some of the lakes, like we were talking about Bull Lake, that it's like, 
we want you to harvest some of the fish because the bigger fish are suffering too, you know? And so that is also something that's kind of fun for kids and something that we talk about a lot is being smart about your harvest, right? Like there are certain places you want to let the fish go. There are certain places you want to keep a fair amount of fish and take them home and eat them. And one of my favorite things to do is do that. You know, I like to harvest some fish, take them home, smoke them, have a meal with my family and friends and talk about the trip, talk about the experience. Like I just went to Alaska. I'm going to be talking about that, you know, when we eat salmon. But Art, you can talk about that a little bit. You know, some of these fisheries, they have lots of fish that maybe they're a little stunted. So you may need to take a few and maybe there's some where you should be releasing, right? Like you're managing them that way. Yeah, you know, mostly like your lake trout in every lake. You, you want to take out the lake trout and eat them or do something with them. Uh, your, your cutthroat and your brookies, you want to throw back and let them get bigger. And, you know, they reach that certain size and a certain age. They're not going to get much bigger anyway. So you might as well take them if you, if you can. They not everything you throw back is going to survive. And so, you, and you'll know by the, the size of a brookie, that thing is not going to last much longer. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know, in Lakers, you know, always take a Laker <laughs> if you, mm-hmm. if you ask me. And then, you know, coming back to the youth and everything, my wife is an average fly fish woman now, and just like my daughter. And so, you know, getting, being Native American and getting the families involved is a huge deal too. Well, I'm sure it's great to go as a family, right? Like it's something you share together and can enjoy together. It's enjoyable until your wife's out fishing you. (laughs) Then it's not so great. But she loves to go shopping. (laughs) Well, that and um, we all know that fishing, especially fly fishing, can be a gear heavy uh, endeavor. And so Art's gear budget, I think, has uh, probably tripled since his wife has gotten involved. (laughs) Well, wife and three daughters, so yeah, it gets pretty pretty expensive every year. Yeah, fly fishing gear is not cheap, and fishing gear in general is not cheap, but fly gear is especially not cheap. But at least you share that passion, though, because, I mean, you talked about horseback riding. There's nothing cheap about horse, having horses and doing horseback riding, but that experience that you have as a result of having that gear and going outdoors is special. It is, yeah, very special. Yeah, and, you know, and to get your wife involved who wasn't really a fisherman before and now doing it and wants to go every weekend. It, it, you know, it actually brought my family closer together. Yeah. They say that what a family who fishes and hunts together stays together. Yeah. I mean, I think it's probably a true thing, right? So I do want to kind of wrap this up and just talk about like, again, you know, if people wanted to get more information on Indie fly or getting a reservation permit so that they can go fishing, we'll start with Indie fly. How do they get in touch with you so that they can, you know, help out or assist or whatever. Yeah, the easiest way is to go to our website, indiefly, I-N-D-I-F-L-Y dot org. Um, and, you know, awareness is always a big thing for us. Tell your family and friends about what we're doing. Um, if you want to make a donation, that's great. We're a 501c3. That money supports programs like arts. Um, you know, we have a couple ways to do that. You, We have like a monthly sustainer program. You know, you, you um, commit to a small dollar amount every month and then, you know, you get some content and things like that. Um, the other thing is I'll mention again is go to a destination, you know, come to wind river, hire a guide, um, you know, uh, make sure you stop and see art and buy your permit. Um, you can now buy permits online, which is a game changer too. Um, but you know, make sure you buy that permit and come experience it for yourself. Yeah. And the travel fishing game uh, website is uh, windriverfishinggame.com and it, it'll show uh, where you can buy your permit and everything else and a map of some of the areas, but you can also see some of the biology work that we're doing with wolverines, grizzly bears, wolves, and everything else too. Yeah. I would encourage you. I, I buy my permit every year in my stamp and I'll tell you what, it's money well spent because fishing's incredible. The scenery will take your breath away. I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous here and you get to meet lots of cool people along the way. So I would encourage you to do that as well and uh, just help support this effort because I think what you guys are doing is is something that's needed. And I mean, it's not just here, it's a lot of places. And I'm sure you guys do a lot of work in different areas, but if there's any last thing you would tell folks, what would it be? Yeah. And just because it's a big area of 2.2 million acres and three to four wardens, we're still out and about. We'll be around. Yeah. Well, thanks guys again for coming on the show. It's, it's been a lot of fun. It's eye opening. And again, um, if you're listening to this and you're like, Hey, I want to get involved in either volunteering or providing funds or just going to come fishing out here, get a hold of us. We'd be happy to help you. But yeah, it's been wonderful having you guys on the show and, uh, I'm sure we'll have to do an update maybe in a year or two and just kind of see where things are at. Yeah. Thanks Patrick. We'd love that. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Patrick. Thanks again for listening to the Radcast outdoors podcast. 
We hope that you've enjoyed the show. If so, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this podcast and subscribe, share, and give us a five-star rating, which really helps other people find the show. You can find all of our shows, recipes, giveaways, videos, and much more at ragcastoutdoors.com. While you're there, please help support the show by purchasing a Radcast Outdoors shirt or hat. Please don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We also have a Radcast community on Facebook called Radcast Nation, and we'd love for you to join in the conversation there. And of course, please help support our sponsors who make this show possible. Thank you again to PK Lures, Bow Spider, and High Mountain Seasonings. Until next time, get out there and enjoy the outdoors. <laughs>